Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Wilson, Executive Director of Planning, Business Development and International Relations at Index Holding and a member of DHAD International Scientific Advisory Board, DISAB. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar brought to you by Waterfalls Education in collaboration between DHAD and Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF. We are delighted to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Mario Stefan. Executive Director, Doctor Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF in the UAE Regional Office. Mr. Mario Stefan is the Executive Director for Médecins Sans Frontières, UAE Office. He brings over 15 years of experience in the humanitarian sector with him, having worked for a number of international organisations in a variety of contexts. He has lived and worked in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Kenya, Afghanistan, Somalia and Egypt. And at a regional level, Mario has held positions covering Eastern and Southern Africa, as well as the MENA and Gulf regions. Mario first worked with MSF in 2009. He holds a master's degree in management and business administration from the Kedge Business School in Bordeaux in France, and an accreditation as a professional trainer from the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health, London, United Kingdom. The topic for today's webinar is COVID-19, Médecins Sans Frontières, Role and Challenges. Throughout the presentation, ladies and gentlemen, you'll get the opportunity to use the uh, Q&A tab, uh, questions related to the presentation. And uh, after Mr. Mario's presentation, we'll do our best to uh, pass some of those questions on to Mario. So without further ado, uh, welcome Mario to this afternoon's webinar. Uh, hope you're well, and uh, I hand over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, delighted to be here and uh, my sincere thanks to uh, Dihad and all the organizers who are giving us this platform that we appreciate very much. Um, so as Paul was saying, I'll start with a, um, a brief presentation. I will try to keep it as brief as possible so that uh, we leave ample space for questions and answers. Um, I would like to start first of all with um, just a, a quick recap or a, a quick introduction of our organization, because a lot of people know uh, our organization by name, uh, whether the French name, whether the MSF acronym, whether Doctors Without Borders, but usually when we start digging and we start asking, what well, do you know exactly who we are and what we do? Uh, sometimes the questions are, can be a little bit <laughs> hazy. Um, so just as a, as a recap and as a reminder to everybody, we are um, an international private medical humanitarian organization. Um, we were born in 1971, and I want to insist on one detail. Um, obviously, doctors uh, were uh, at the beginning uh, of our inception, uh, but it wasn't only doctors who created Doctors Without Borders, it was also journalists. And this is quite important because we uh, believe very strongly in speaking out on behalf of our patients. And um, what we call um, the speaking out, what we call the témoignage, what we call uh, testimony um, is very important and is an integral part of our action because we do believe that uh, we need to come forward sometimes when the voices of our patients um, does not get through. Doctors Without Borders uh, works basically in three type of contexts, uh, context of conflicts, uh, context of natural disaster or man-made disasters, and what we call uh, context of sanitary deserts, meaning uh, areas where there is simply no healthcare or no access to healthcare, and uh, where people can simply die because they can't reach a clinic or they can't reach a hospital. So those are really the three areas if I would want to sum it up, where uh, you will find Doctors Without Borders. Um, we are uh, an independent organization, meaning we rely on uh, private contributions to function. We are truly independent, and that means that we have the possibility to do our own assessments, and we only decide to intervene based on the needs that we identify, and not based on any type of third-party agenda or external um, agenda. Um, we're a humanitarian organization. We believe in neutrality and impartiality. And that means that we never take any sides and we treat people um, regardless of creed, culture, religion, uh, race, political affiliation, a patient is a patient. 
Doctors Without Borders started almost 50 years ago. We'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary uh, next year. Um, and yes, I think the age uh, comparison is quite an interesting one. Um, from that little group of doctors who availed their services um, to the Red Cross movement back in the days, uh, we have become a truly international movement with a, a secretariat out of Geneva. Um, our staff numbers, you can see them on the screen. Uh, and they keep on changing depending on um, the emergencies uh, that we work on and that we deal with, of course. We are working today in over 70 countries, uh, different projects, sometimes several projects in one country, sometimes one project, really depending on, on the needs. And as you can see, um, this is truly a without borders organization. We will go where the needs are and we will go where uh, our patients uh, need to be attended to. So. Um, what happened uh, at the beginning of the year, um, I want to start saying that we have been hit by COVID, uh, like all of you have been hit by COVID. I mean, by surprise, uh, not something we had expected, not um, the spread of the disease uh, that we were anticipating. Uh, however, uh, as we are used to, uh, we had the capacity as a um, an emergency organization to uh, turn around quite quick and start responding. Um, I think what is really the most powerful, if I may, uh, side of, of this virus is its weakness uh, in the sense that it, it was very difficult for everybody to really measure um, the true extent of the damage, uh, the true extent of, of the contamination. And of course, how would we be able to um, treat patients, because that is a no-brainer, uh, but of course treat them and keeping everybody safe and keeping um, our staff safe. So um, I want to say that as a medical emergency organization, um, we were very quick um, on the front line. Uh, I do remember the initial phone calls, and um, I'm going to go through the presentation uh, and discuss a bit more of the specific challenges uh, that we faced, but uh, we've been hit once more, like all of you have been. We had to modify our supply, we had to modify our way of operating. Um, we are called without borders, but when borders are closed and airspaces are closed, uh, then it becomes a bit more difficult to travel around the world, to move, to uh, be able to have our team rotate. And of course, uh, we were not just sitting there waiting for COVID to happen. <clears throat> You saw in the previous slide the number of projects that we were already involved in, and those projects were still were still ongoing, were still running, and and we had to maintain them. That meant we had to maintain the supply of of drugs and medical equipment. Um, we had to rotate the teams when we had to rotate them. Uh, we had to make sure that everybody stayed safe. Unfortunately. Uh, COVID did not stop uh, natural disaster, it did not stop other diseases, it did not stop tuberculosis, it did not stop HIV, uh, it did not stop civil war. Um, it just added uh, an additional layer uh, in many of the places, if not all the places where um, we were working. Uh, and I have to say that today uh, we are uh, present, or rather we uh, run uh, COVID-19 interventions in over 65 countries. And again, that numbers continue to change. Uh, we will disengage from some places if uh, we are not needed anymore, and we will increase our presence in other places. But to consider that we are present today in over 70 countries, and in 65 of those, we are running COVID-19 related activities, give you an idea of the degree of mobilization of our organization. Um, three challenges uh, really and i think important to pause and ponder and and understand what the implications are for an organization such as ours um i want to i want to start with the last one that you see on the slide which is the protection of staff and patients um, i think it is crucial it is uh, extremely important to make sure that uh, none of our staff uh, gets infected uh, in the duty of their work, and none of our existing patients uh, get infected. Uh, and as we all know, a big issue with um, this virus has been uh, the fact that we need to wear masks, uh, the fact that we need to be protected, we need to have PPE, personal protection equipment, and we need to have that in ample quantities 
not to compromise in any way, neither the safety of, uh, again, our personnel um, or the safety of, of the patients. The second aspect is we, of course, uh, needed to be able to treat COVID-19 patients. And what does that mean, practically speaking? Um, we need to have the facilities. We need to have sufficient space. We need to be able to separate existing patients. We need to be able to uh, come up with new facilities, new installations where um, we would be working. Um, and all that, of course, takes quite a lot of, of, of planning in such a, um, quite a short uh, amount of time. Uh, that one has been a, a very big issue. Um, and of course, we've been affected by the travel restrictions. We've been affected by um, the pressure on finding the supply. Uh, this, has not been, this has not been easy. Uh, what we have seen is quite unprecedented in terms of such a pressure I don't think in our history that we've been affected by travel restrictions um, the way we have been affected, uh, we have been affected here. Um, we have had to reinvent ourselves. Um, I don't count how many times anymore. <laughs> we had to find out to be very creative on the solutions, to find ways of getting people in despite uh, all those constraints, um, find ways to let our team breathe and, and rest and not reach breaking point and at the same time maintain the activities. It has been quite, it has been quite difficult. Um, and the same would extend to finding uh, the supply. Um, those of you in Dubai uh, were lucky enough not to be affected by that. I mean, I, I, I live in Dubai. I found masks in pharmacies. Uh, I managed to find uh, gloves, gowns. Uh, maybe some quantities were reducing in one place. We would find them in another place. We've been extremely lucky uh, to be in this situation. Unfortunately, it hasn't been the case um, all around the world. And um, sometimes the supply that would take, I don't know, uh, one week would that now take three weeks. Uh, we would guarantee a purchase that would then be canceled. Uh, our shipments would be frozen um, on the way, you know, coming to Dubai, let's say we, um, we buy masks in China and those masks all of a sudden get stopped on the way by third party authorities who uh, want to make sure that there is no, um, you know, dodgy business going on because of such pressure on, on that equipment. And, and of course, on the other hand, our operations are still running and we need to make sure that those operations um, don't suffer from a lack of supply because once more, if we can't protect our staff and patients, we cannot operate. Um, that has led us to, on top of uh, providing clinical care and providing medical care um, to COVID infected patients, uh, on top of um, uh, really working hard to ensure that uh, everybody would be um, uh, safe and protected and that all our activities would continue um, running, uh, it was very clear for us that we had to speak out and speak out uh, quite strongly, or I would say increasingly strongly, on several aspects linked to this crisis. Um, first of all, as uh, one of our uh, inside the departments called the Access Campaign brilliantly sums up, medicine should not be a luxury. Uh, nobody should die because they cannot afford uh, health care. And uh, once more, uh, in a lot of places, if we are not able to guarantee um, no patents uh, on drugs, on vaccines, or uh, if we can't have access to generic medication, if we can't have access to um, vaccines at uh, normal prices, but some people literally die. Uh, we've been involved in this type of lobbying for the past um, the past 20 years actually. Uh, and we started by calling on no patents on any vaccine, on any cure um, that would uh, we would come up with uh, to tackle COVID-19, whether on the medication or whether on the vaccine. Um, we are now moving uh, to a different situation that is equally as alarming today, which is the lack of regulation worldwide that we are seeing on personal protection equipment, on PPE. Um, it is absolutely crucial um, for authorities around the world to be able to regulate uh, the supply, to be able to regulate uh, the, the, the pricing of such elements. Um, it is very crucial that we are able to um, get our hands on sufficient testing kits. The testing capacity is very important, as you can imagine. Um, and this is very difficult when prices, you know, skyrocket, when prices are multiplied sometimes by up to 30 times 
um, the initial value. And regardless of how, how much more we pay, uh, the more we put our money into those type of products, uh, the less money we have to treat our patients. And this is not a choice that um, a humanitarian organization should do. So uh, we call, and I would renew my call here, um, on regulations to be put in place uh, worldwide so that we are able to guarantee decent pricing, uh, acceptable pricing, and acceptable use and transfer of personal protective equipment. Um, I want to now uh, bring it down a bit and have a little bit of a focus on the African continent. Uh, as you know, and we'll talk about it, the next theme of uh, the DIAD conference will evolve around the African continent. And uh, I would like to share with you uh, this little video about MSF tackling COVID-19 on the continent. So if you can please have the video now. My name is Abu Bakr Bakri. I'm uh, the uh, health advisor of MSF in East Africa, focusing on Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and Somalia. The first cases of COVID-19 uh, were reported in East African uh, countries middle of, of March, and since then numbers have been uh, gradually increasing in the region. We are talking about a region uh, that affected by many issues, starting from uh, intercommunal conflicts, displacement uh, due to these conflicts, and also the heavy impact of uh, climate change, such as uh, floods, uh, droughts, uh, locust invasion. Access to health care uh, for many populations is already restricted. That the region is a host uh, of several millions uh, of refugees and displaced uh, population. Uh, this, uh, specific, this specific group uh, live in very precarious situations. They lack the basic services such as uh, water, uh, soap uh, for their uh, basic hygiene. Uh, during this outbreak, uh, women will keep uh, delivering, uh, children will keep falling sick, uh, people will still require their medications for their chronic diseases. So it's uh, very important to keep uh, at least some of the life-saving activities. We are facing in these uh, situations uh, global shortages uh, for many supplies such as uh, personal protection equipment, not to mention the lack of ICU beds which is really, really necessary for to manage uh, severe patients. We in MSF are doing our best, so we are preparing uh, our staff in terms of uh, having the necessary means uh, to protect them. So we are working uh, together with the different ministries of health in the region, conducting uh, trainings regarding infection and prevention control, preparing uh, triage and screening areas, and also preparing the layout uh, for isolation and treatment centers. What we need is uh, to be to stay focused and lots of solidarity. This is a pandemic that faces the entire globe, and I think the only way to combat it is to work hand in hand. Thank you very much. I will. Take back control of uh, the screen, and I hope that this presentation really served as a good uh, illustration of um, basically how, on a daily basis, uh, in a in a challenging place, in a challenging part of the world, uh, we are able to um, respond and we are able to support authorities in their response to COVID-19. Um, I think this brings me to the end of uh, my presentation, and I would be uh, delighted to hear questions now and so that we start uh, getting a bit more into the thick of the action. Thank you, Mario, for your uh, presentation. Uh, very informative, and uh, thank you for sharing the video there of the, the great work that uh, your colleagues are doing uh, in challenging environments across the world. I don't know if, what are your uh priorities right now as msf is it possible to have a priority or is it too broad to say that you have a priority 
Um, I, I want to say, but by some aspect, it is a rolling, uh, rolling priority, Paul, uh, because the, um, the situation is evolving. It's evolving in terms of each country is having a different, um, um, a different level of severity or a different level of exposure uh, to, to the virus. There hasn't been, there has been very little similarity from one intervention uh, to another. In some places, it's been about focusing on the health promotion. In other places, it has been about focusing on the actual uh, medical care. Um, in other places, it has been really in terms of supporting with uh, the proper equipment we had available that some authorities did not necessarily have available. Um, I, I want to take one example that I think is quite revealing, which is the example of oxygen. Again, uh, for those of us who live in Dubai, if unfortunately you end up in a hospital room uh, and you need to be put on oxygen, oxygen is a button at the back of your bed and, and it activates the floor and the supply. In a lot of places where we work, this does not exist. If you don't have sufficient supply of oxygen, uh, you will die. So uh, to give you again another number so you would have an idea, in um, southern Yemen, we are running the only COVID center uh, available there. We run with uh, up to some type of 8,000 liters of oxygen uh, per day. And we need to avail it, we need to produce it, uh, we need to have the concentrators um, available. Uh, this is this is really uh, a big challenge. Now, luckily, a challenge we know how to deal with, but that would be one priority somewhere. In another place, it's the fact that we are not able to have our teams rotate. Um, you know, somebody, we've all been stuck, and once more, <laughs> I will never complain about being stuck in a place like Dubai, but when you're stuck in a war zone, and you are still dealing with the, the security considerations, with the other projects, uh, with a certain level of fatigue, uh, and we're not able to send, you know, uh, replacement, um, that is a challenge. Uh, so I, wa I want to say really, if I go back to our, our presentation, what we see, regardless of where, but what we see as coming back all the time is really the restrictions on, 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 on the movements. Uh, that is a big challenge. Uh, the second one is really making sure that we are able to avail uh, the supply, the medical equipment, and the drugs um, that are needed. And, and last but not least, really the, the protection of our staff and patients. Uh, no patient of ours should feel threatened uh, in one of our facilities because they know that there are other COVID-19 positive patients, you know, that are in our facility. Everybody should be treated and everybody should be protected. So uh, maintaining our existing activities, rising up to be able to uh, care for uh, COVID-19 uh, patients uh, and ensuring the protection of everybody at all time has really been, you know, a defining, um, a defining feature. Uh, and I have to say that I haven't had one day since really the onslaught of this pandemic that had looked similar um, to the day before, the day, the day after. Um, uh, I still think it's a good thing because it's a very dynamic, it's a very fluid situation. Uh, and uh, we, we have some, some good news. We, we started working at the beginning of the year in Europe, uh, which was qu quite rare for an organization such as ours to work there. Uh, and right now we are terminating our, we have uh, stopped our intervention in Spain. Uh, those are good news. So we are hoping, I'm just hoping that we'll have more of those good news and that we are able to scale down or uh, hopefully stop intervention because that means uh, that you don't need us anymore. And that means that the overall situation is improving. Thank you, Mario. So yeah, uh, multiple priorities as always. And uh, I think we said the other day that you, you've done years in months recently um, in, in terms of your workload. You mentioned uh, scaling down in Spain and uh, other European places. Is it, you have, uh, we have funding, of course, that comes into MSF, you mentioned funding. Um, so my first question would be around, is this an opportunity for you to, I'm not sure how you go about, but I know a lot of your funding is private uh, donors, as you said. Do you do campaigns in relation to funding? Is it something that you would look to increase during this particular um, pandemic? Um, the MSF strength is in its independence. I was, I was, I started my presentation with that. And uh, to give you an idea, 96% of our 
funding today comes from private sources. It comes from people like you and I. And, and this is something we are uh, very attached to. Um, no, no one situation is the same, of course, but this independence really grants us not only the, the, the possibility of, of assessing our needs and determining where we intervene and when, but also it allows us to really put the money, if you allow me, uh, where it is where it is needed and that today this flexibility um, really gives us this this possibility to really shift from one place to another at, at the speed um, that it, that is required and that is necessary and uh, by supporting MSF today uh, you will be supporting COVID operation but I want to say that it, what's very important for us is we never start with the campaign. We never start with the, the funding aspect. We, we start with the operation. We are uh, luckily strong enough to start implementing and then determine the extent of it. And this is what determines the type of campaigning that we do um, on the financial side of things. Uh, because if we start uh, taking uh, money for a specific cause, um, we need and we uh, report against it, but we need to spend it on that specific cause. So um, from that aspect, you know, a specific campaigning around COVID, which we are doing today, um, is, is the result of us determining what is uh, the actual added volume or added financial volume that COVID related operations are putting on the table. Um, and this is how we this is how we would look at very specific campaigning. However, we have our general um, uh, fundraising that goes on uh, on a year long basis. And I think one of the most beautiful aspects of, of this organization, I would say, because uh, I used to be a donor before I joined this organization, is that when you support the organization, uh, you know, within a click today, you can see what you are supporting and you can be supporting different projects and you can be supporting, uh, most importantly, people in need where the need uh, is. So I'll finish with, with one thing, of course, we, we campaign and we fundraise um, in accordance with the rules and regulations uh, of each country where we are present. A country like the UAE um, is uh, quite regulated to make sure that uh, when uh, campaigns like those happen, um, they happen and that people giving money uh, are not missled around, you know, and that the money doesn't disappear and it really goes for the cause. Um, and so we make sure to comply with those, uh, with all those rules and regulations, of course. Um, today we are uh, raising money through um, a crowdfunding platform, uh, our partners, yallagive.com. Um, and so you can give securely, you can give safely, and you can support uh, our COVID operations um, around the world today. Thank you. So uh, you talked about uh, you're a massive human resource organization. You gave us the figures in the, the 40,000 and you, you mentioned that now you, some of your resources are ramping down a little in Europe. So possibly resources can move in terms of human resources to other other areas. Something that crossed my mind was equipment. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure. But uh, again, as we see in Europe, it looks like uh, we're now starting to see a scaling down of uh, a lot of the hospitals and the the, uh, the temporary hospitals, if you like, that have piled into themselves lots of equipment. But I guess logically to me, it would be a time to shift that equipment to other parts of the world that are about to go into a different phase. But you mentioned something very interesting. What we plug into the back of a, a unit in, a, in a, a, a temporary hospital in the UK or wherever it may be in, a, in an exhibition center, even if you get that equipment, you're, where you're operating in rural areas, very different infrastructure. So some equipment just isn't going to cross the border uh, in the same way, right? So some equipment and not some equipment. Um, you're correct about that. I mean, I, I think it's important to um, remind people that as an organization, again, who's 49 years old today, we um, have had over the years the possibility to develop um, appropriate uh, equipment, appropriate support to our operations, which allow us to work in, in, in areas 
where you will find nothing basically or where it's difficult to go. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our features, especially in um, earthquake prone areas is an inflatable hospital, uh, which is basically th think about uh, when you go to a circus and you see that big inflated tent, uh, think about it as a hospital like that, that we are able to inflate and render fully operational uh, within 72 hours uh, and basically have the surgical block ready in 24 hours. This allows you to reach a place where everything has been destroyed. You don't need to look for a hospital. You just inflate your, uh, your tents. Uh, obviously, it's a bit more complicated than what I'm making it sound because um, we need to plug um, a whole lot of things to make sure that um, the infection control, that the air control, um, that everything is in place. We need to make sure that uh, um, everything is set up with the norms that you would find in any given hospital. Uh, but at the end of the day, we are able to deploy within 72 hours and start critical life saving care. Um, there are many examples. Uh, you might have seen a, a weird Land Cruiser uh, vehicle on, on my first slide when I was introducing the organization that had um, didn't have tire, but it has some kind of triangles. This has allowed us to work in places where there are no roads and where places where even, you know, the hardest of your four by fours uh, could not get through. So there is innovation, there is uh, testing, there is a different uh, type of projects. We have um, hospitals on wheels, you know, we have uh, container hospitals. Um, and, and all that comes with the set of equipment, with the, the um, a specific modus operandi, and our teams are trained on it. So it, it's, it, it could be that some of the equipment that you find in places where it won't be needed anymore uh, could be uh, transferred or could be made available, absolutely. Um, it's not that we would necessarily need the exact equipment. We know what to replicate and we know um, how to adapt. But I, I, I want to say that airspace has been closed for people's movements around the planet, as we all know, and we've all, um, uh, we've all been uh, affected by it. Uh, but I, ha I have to say cargo and supply itself uh, has been less subject to, to restrictions. And it has been a bit more easy uh, to fly supply in and out. The problem, you will still have two problems. One is when some specific regulations or lack of regulation uh, prevent you from shifting specific equipment, this is where you start having an issue. Um, and uh, the second issue is sometimes, again, you know, I think the example of, of southern Yemen, you know, a, a part of the world that's completely devastated by, uh, by conflict. Um, you know, you, you need to find the oxygen, uh, you need to put on a supply uh, system. We know that in a conflict zone, um, you know, you don't get your supply the way you would get it in, into a regular place. Um, so um, some of the challenges were not new challenges, but what it meant for us, practically speaking, is uh, an increased level of planning because if you know that you know to get your truck in or to get your plane in you usually it usually takes you one week now it was, it's taking us maybe three weeks in and we really need to plan appropriately because again uh, we can't have you know um, our staff uh, stopping uh, their clinical work or their operations or uh, their consultations because uh, they don't have enough masks or they don't have enough gowns, you know, or they don't have enough gloves uh, or they don't have enough medication. So, um, yes, there is, there is a bit, and, and we believe that in some aspects, you know, the situation is bound, is bound to improve. But let me focus really on also the pricing um, elements, uh, you know, to see that uh, some items uh, have had their prices multiplied by up to 30 times. Uh, the initial price, um, you know, is is really problematic, and uh, you are faced with making sometimes incredibly difficult choices uh, because you don't want to be wasting uh, you don't want to be wasting money, uh, and at the same time, you need really to make sure that the operations um, are ongoing. There aren't many solutions to that. If if um, uh, such processes are not uh, sufficiently regulated and well regulated this is something that's extremely difficult uh, extremely difficult to manage or that becomes extremely cumbersome and extremely tiring uh, I want to say for um, for our teams so uh, I will actually pay tribute to a lot of my colleagues who have had very little uh, to sleep since just to try to make sense of, of that equipment situation and that supply situation thank you Mario uh, 
one of our uh, participants asks, uh, and it's, it's relevant in times like this more than ever perhaps, and that's about collaborations. Um, in the field, I, uh, as the term goes, uh, are you collaborating with the UN or WHO? Is that something that you do anyway? Is that something that's increasing now? How does that work for you? Um, as an independent organization, uh, the independence also comes with uh, being effectively independent on the ground and sometimes, you know, uh, maybe distancing yourself a bit just to make sure that you are fully accepted by the populations that you are serving and that people understand uh, that we are truly who we are and nothing else. Um, so there's a lot of contexts where um, they, they could be uh, coordination, they could be some exchanges, but they would not necessarily be collaboration. Now, having said that, in the context of a pandemic or in a context uh, of, of responding to um, um, a virus, uh, first of all, you, you need to look at the volume. In a lot of places, you know, no matter how mighty the aid system is or believes it, that it is, uh, of course, um, it, it is down to health authorities of the country uh, to be able to manage it. I mean, there's a question of volume, there's a question of quantity of, of drugs and medical equipment, and, and, and we don't believe, one second, that we can substitute ourselves, you know, to a um, Ministry of Health or, or, or to a government. Uh, uh, as a matter of speak. So uh, I want to say in, in context like, like this one, um, we, we, we will collaborate with health authorities because uh, we might find ourselves providing a specific expertise that they don't have or providing additional support uh, because they're completely um, overloaded, you know. Um, one of our first interventions was in, in northern Italy. Uh, of all places, and, and it was simply because the system, as it was said, could not cope with the increased and sudden influx um, of patients. So it doesn't really matter how, you know, developed you are or not. If you are not able to, um, to sustain the sheer number of patients coming to you, you're not able to deal with it. And, and, and we saw some, some facilities literally collapse under the weight uh, or under such, such pressure. So uh, we do work together um, in, that, in that situation. Uh, so I wanna say, yes, collaboration can happen with, um, with health authorities. Uh, collaboration can happen in very specific uh, contexts, li like, like the COVID-19 one, which I wanna say is a very specific context. Um, uh, but then I wanna say, you know, we, are, we, we, we try to stick as much as possible because of our mandate uh, you know, to, our, to our independence. When you are in a conflict zone, uh, when you are in a place where, you know, there's a lot of question, we are outsiders and we come in, um, if we're not able to demonstrate that every single time that our only uh, mandate is uh, to treat uh, our patients and uh, not to have any other agenda, that our funding does not follow any agenda, but the one of uh, serving those populations that we are trying to assist, um, then it becomes problematic for us. So we, we stick I would say quite uh, quite strongly to our independence in situations like that. Thank you, Mario. Uh, a few participant questions coming now. I'm going to try and combine two of them. Um, the, in view of uh, the developments over the last few weeks, mm -hmm. uh, can you give your prognosis from your uh, what you know from your colleagues in the field and what's going on in terms of impact of COVID in Africa? It's a very broad question and then as a second question from somebody who specifically asks about Somalia uh, in the settlements so Africa in general going forward um, and and secondly specifically about uh, settlements in uh, Somalia okay of course um, so first of all about, about Africa in general I think um, you know so it's, it's we're talking about you know a, a continent uh, so uh, uh, I really don't want to generalize, but I think um, that what we are observing on the continent through the different interventions that uh, uh, we have had there um, is that it, it doesn't look for now, and with emphasis on the for now, um, that the countries have been affected as, um, as badly in a way. Having said that, um, again, it's very difficult for me to 
give general and broad statements because um, our intervention right now in Burkina Faso um, um, is, is quite strong it's, and it's quite consequent. Uh, we, we have seen some foyers in Africa and um, I want to quote one of my colleagues um, uh, who was saying that it's... Um, it's going to be a marathon uh, on the African continent to handle COVID. It's not going to be a race uh, like it could have been or like we could have seen it in um, other contexts in other areas today. Um, it's, I think, uh, what, what is worrisome, let, let, let's start with the gloomy side and I want to finish on a, on a more positive note, is um, that a lot of the health systems can be fragilized or can be more fragile than uh, what we know, what we have seen in other places. And so the concern is that those systems are able to cope uh, with a potential volume, with a potential uh, uh, increase in cases, with potential foyers. And uh, we need to make sure that those uh, systems are, uh, you know, that we are here to support uh, in an adequate, in an adequate uh, manner, in an adequate fashion. Um, I want to keep in mind also that uh, the the way we approach um, health systems uh, on the continent sometimes is a bit different from our hospital centric uh, approach that 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 we all know, which results in when you are in a in a um, uh, in a pandemic like this one into a big influx to the hospital. And um, I really want to highlight the, the the community side. Of, of health management and the, the reliance on communities uh, on the continent, in many places, especially in rural areas, which um, allows you to handle to handle the the, uh, the pandemic a bit differently. I think my colleague on video was saying, you know, what we need is solidarity. Yeah, I don't think anybody can pretend today that you know they can solve it alone. They can solve it by themselves. It's really going to take you know the whole community getting together with the health providers. Um, to to be able to, to support that. Um, and I, I want to go back and, and really emphasize this the, the issue that I was presenting on oxygen. We need to make sure uh, you know that um, uh, crucial items like this one will be available and will be available in, in good quantities. Um, that, that is a challenge. But having, having said all that, um, again, what, what we are seeing today, we are not seeing the, the doom day scenarios that, you know, uh, we heard. Um, and I, I, I want to remain quite humble uh, in front of this disease. I, I think, unfortunately for all of us, I think this applies at, you know, the whole level of the planet. Um, it, it is still a bit too early to, uh, to be able to determine, you know, uh, how the virus is evolving, how, how are we coping and adapting uh, to a DD, um, most of what we're seeing today, what we have seen from the beginning has been, as we say, on, on the curative side of things. Uh, and it's still a bit early. Um, there are some breakthroughs here and there. Uh, how sustainable those breakthroughs in the research and the findings are, um, I want to say time will tell. And I think really this image of, of a marathon um, is the one that, uh, that, that, that I want to I, I wanna stick to, uh, basically. Um, on uh, uh, Somalia today, um, and um, just um, to to let you know, we we work in in uh, in different parts of Somalia, and we work in Somaliland uh, in the north, and we work in uh, southern uh, southern Somalia. So we are working uh, with the authorities. Um, we are helping a lot with infection control. Uh, we are helping a lot with hygiene measures. We are helping a lot with preventive uh, measures. And uh, those trainings, you know, a lot of them uh, aim to support the, the healthcare personnel existing there to identify COVID-19 symptoms and, uh, you know, triage the suspected cases so that uh, we stop any potential um, infection. Um, we're providing technical advice and logistics support, and we're setting up isolation structures um, in different places. Um, in Hargeisa, uh, in, in, in the region of Somaliland, in, in the north, uh, as part of a task force composed by different organizations, uh, we're providing support to the Ministry of Health in setting up a COVID-19 center. Um, we supported with light donation of materials, um, training of emergency room staff, ambulance driver, and also um, training of trainers and regional medical staff on all these issues um, above that I uh, presented. I think that kind of helps us go into one of the other participants' questions. You, you talked about uh, your resources again, and uh, what you mentioned, this is a marathon. 
and uh, we're in the heat. We've just started in the first uh, few kilometers, and we know how marathons <laughs> uh, work out. So, how are you adapted to supporting the staff in absence of being able to rotate them? Uh, is this something that is uh, something obviously you're looking at very carefully, I think, in the context of a marathon and the context of having to rotate staff uh, at the same time. Um, yeah, and, and I think I think it's important to um, also clarify that the majority of our staff are um, our our um, our local teams. Um, uh, the, the rotation happens at different level. Obviously, in some areas, you will not find a, a certain set of skills or a certain set of expertise, and you need to bring it from outside, you know, and I, I, I want to say in a way, there are in places you need some sometimes very specific medical expertise or very specific uh, specialty, and you don't necessarily find it uh, on the ground. So um, this is where our international staff comes, comes into play. Um, I think it's also important to remind everybody that um, we are a medical organization but we have a lot of non-medical personnel with us. Uh, we have logisticians, we have managers, we have administrators, uh, we have drivers, we have guards, uh, I mean watchmen, uh, um, we have um, um, logisticians, um, and those are people who are support functions that are key support functions that allow uh, our doctors and our medical personnel to do to do their job. Um, what we're seeing today, when when it comes to rotation, is it has been difficult to um, MSF invests more and more into the mobility of of uh, of its staff. You know, uh, people will move from one country to another, gain experience, bring in their own expertise, build their own capacity, come back with added experience. Um, this is something that has been very difficult to do once the borders um, have closed. Bringing in that specific experience of, or expertise that you can't find uh, on the ground has also been difficult. And I want to say, we already, as an emergency organization, run operations uh, at a certain pace, of course, and uh, with a certain level of urgency, obviously. Um, but then the COVID-19 pandemic has added um, to the volume, has added uh, to the fatigue, has added to the welfare of our staff. So uh, we, 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 might, we have a lot of projects where staff didn't have necessarily, um, uh, the, the, the goal was not to move them or, or to shift them, uh, but the welfare of our staff is, is crucial. We need to make sure that, you know, and people don't reach breaking point and people are able to breathe. And, um, you know, in some places, if you, if you know that you can't be replaced, uh, it's sometimes difficult to take you out of a certain operation, you know, and then um, what do you decide to change? How do you decide to change your operations? Uh, do you decide to stop uh, some aspects? Um, so, um, yes, there is, there is the travel and the rotation, but it's also about, uh, and I would say even more importantly so, the welfare of staff on the ground, 90% of, of our um, human resources are uh, is our national teams, you know, they are the ones who are there, who stay there, who carry the projects, and um, we need to make sure that uh, their welfare, you know, remains uh, um, a priority, and it is uh, for us, and we are trying to find solutions uh, to um, ensure that people are able to, you know, um, take a breather, uh, as we say, take a step back, uh, be able to rest, be able to recuperate, uh, be able to go back to their families, be able to um, you know, uh, reconnect a bit, uh, and so that you are then uh, back with the energy that you need to run those operations. And again, we'll finish with that. Uh, it is a fluid, um, it is a fluid situation. Um, regulations and restrictions keep on changing, uh, left and right, all around the world, all our different projects. So um, we basically try to piggyback as quick as possible on any. Uh, loosening of uh, those restrictions and, and adapt, keeping in mind again, uh, protecting our staff and the protection is not just the mask and the gloves, it's also making sure that people are okay uh, and are okay to do their job and are okay after uh, their shift ends at the clinic or the hospital. Thank you, Mario. Uh, actually, this uh, is related, I think one of our participants asks, uh, how does your organization actually communicate with governments regarding these operations? Um, 
so uh, th there are places you know we've been working in some in some countries for for many years and um as an organization we have a certain establishment and country we have uh, um, certain channels of communication that exist that have been that have been built and we just activate those channels of communication to let uh, our interlocutors know what we're doing how we're doing it uh, we also look obviously into the, the rules and regulation in place uh, and we comply to it in terms of uh, making sure that this is what we need to do this is where we need to go this is what we have to do uh, we communicate I would say in a very um, standard way from that side but uh, I think it's very important also to note that uh, we're not necessarily uh, welcome everywhere uh, and that sometimes some negotiations can be quite complicated. Some negotiations can be quite tough. Uh, we have been faced in with several situations where, um, you know, some authorities in parts of the world uh, uh, would not grant access to the organization, would not allow us to um, assess the needs independently, uh, would not allow us to intervene um, in a purely humanitarian fashion. And I think those channels of communication are very important. Again, I think it's all connected. Going back to our independence, if we're not able to demonstrate on an almost daily basis on neutrality, our impartiality, um, our independence, um, you know, it, it's sometimes difficult to, to gain uh, the trust. So, um, the official channels of communications are there. We open specific channels. Uh, there are specific forums and alleys, you know, when, when uh, crises like that uh, happen. Um, we will communicate with bodies like the World Health Organization. Um, obviously, on the ground, sometimes, we, we, you know, we can be alone in some places because uh, we've been the only ones who've been able to reach those places. Uh, but we are also, you know, we, we, we work in environments where other organizations are there uh, with different mandates, uh, with mandates that are complementary, um, authorities that are there. In some places when, when we uh, end project, if they're not, you know, uh, purely emergency related, uh, we might hand over the projects uh, to the local authorities uh, by, you know, we, we would donate the equipment, I would say, for instance, um, that's on the ground. Uh, pass it on, do a transition, do a handover, and then the local authorities uh, take on, or it's a matter just of shutting down the intervention that was purely emergency. There is no need uh, for us anymore, and then we stop. So um, part of it is, the, I would say, the, the regulatory part. Uh, part of it is making sure that we are engaging um, the right people and able to do our work and able to have all the facilities and the guarantees to be able to work. And unfortunately, in some cases, uh, not having that channel of communication or being, um, you know, uh, pushed back or denied. But uh, this is where we keep on coming back until we're allowed in. Thank you, Mario. Um, one of our participants asks uh, again about PPE. Um, that in the beginning of the crisis, it was very difficult to procure to find the PPE. Is this still a big problem or is it getting better now? Um, I would say overall there is a slight, uh, there is a slight improvement uh, in the current situation, uh, but has the situation gone back to normal? No, not yet. And um, availability is a key thing and availability is also linked to um, to pricing. I, I want to emphasize that, uh, you know, beyond, beyond the PPE, uh, let us all keep in mind more than ever the testing capacity. Uh, having, having sufficient tests um, is, is, is very, very uh, important today. Uh, being able to guarantee sufficient supply of, you know, I, I talked a lot about oxygen today, uh, but having supplies of oxygen is, is very important, um, is very important too. So um, I want to say there was, there was a bit of a panic worldwide. Uh, that we saw and, and that we, 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 we had to contend with at the beginning when it came to the, to the PPE. Today, somehow the situation seems to be, um, especially in countries where uh, uh, the numbers of, um, of infections are going down, uh, where, where restrictions are being slowly uh, loosened, where the, um, 
medical concerns are, are going down a bit, this is places where it becomes a bit less uh, of an issue. But have we gone back to normal? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, are there still concerns? There are concerns. And the concern is really around uh, um, having such markets regulated uh, so that if uh, we find ourselves back in the same situation some month down the line or a year down the line, who knows at this stage, unfortunately. Uh, some people talk about that second wave. Will it come or not? We hope not. Um, but we need to make sure that those regulations are in place um, to avoid seeing what we saw. We saw, you know, uh, and I'm sure some of our um, viewers uh, saw in the news uh, or heard or read about uh, supply that changed hands on the tarmac as it was being loaded um, on the plane. Uh, we... Uh, you know, it, it was it was it was the wild west <laughs> on some on some accounts, yeah. um, and uh, we just hope that this situation will um, not repeat itself. And I say I would finish by saying, you know, uh, the lesson learned here is um, uh, really the contingency planning. Uh, as an organization, uh, we believe very strongly in contingency planning to be able to deploy when emergencies. Uh, happen and this is not a static concept uh, by far and so our contingency planning is evolving in light of that situation to hopefully um, not be faced with the same dilemmas that we were faced with thank you mario so uh we're almost coming um to the uh end of our one hour um so i'd like to uh finish with a couple of questions for you um, one is related to the event that you know very well, uh, Dihad, um, and you're very much involved with that. So we have uh, the theme uh, for the 17th edition um, next year, uh, 15 to 17th of March. Um, aid after coronavirus, a focus on Africa. We've talked about Africa a lot already, but you, are you okay with the theme? You like the theme? Um, what do you think? I think it'll be difficult to find a more relevant theme than um, than this one. To be to be very honest with you, uh, again, as you as you uh, as you said, Paul, we I've talked a bit about uh, the situation on the African continent. Um, the next Dihad will happen in March um, of next year, which will have given us by then, uh, you know, ample time to observe, learn, see how the situation is evolving. And I think the amount of uh, knowledge, the amount of experience sharing. Uh, that we're bound to have um, at Dihad uh, next year is simply going to be phenomenal. I think, um, as you said, yes, I am, I am quite involved and I don't count anymore the number of, of uh, uh, Dihads I, uh, I attended uh, over the years, but uh, knowing the capacity Dihad has to attract the appropriate interlocutors and having the interlocutors coming from the African continent, because this was hopefully the, uh, what we were working towards for this year's uh, Dihad, and of course the conference was, um, was postponed. Um, I think we will have the appropriate interlocutors um, really reflecting and giving us, I think, the, the, this exchange of knowledge and this sharing of experiences by the right people um, is going to be, uh, yes, probably one of the most relevant, you know, um, public events with a, a similar theme. So, yes, I'm looking very much forward to it and uh, um, hoping we'll, uh, we'll be able to learn and concentrate, you know, um, over those three days uh, as much uh, knowledge as we can. Great. And uh, do you have a message for your friends, colleagues, um, peers in the humanitarian community? Um, oh, abs absolutely. And it's a very simple message. It's uh, keep it up. Uh, I think, you know, um, COVID has, of course, um, affected us all. Uh, at a personal level, at a professional level, but uh, I know for a fact that the humanitarian community has been under uh, incredible strains at, at all levels. Whether you know we talked about fundraising, we talked about operations, we talked about support. Uh, we, it's it's been incredibly heavy uh, for everybody. So uh, yes, it's really to pay tribute to everybody and say, uh, really keep it up, take care of yourselves. Uh, um, I like very much uh, the motto "We are together" because I think more than ever. We are together, but um, at the end of the day, the, the message really should go to um, the communities that are affected and, and to our patients 
um, you know, the, those are those are the the people to whom I pay tribute today. Um, it's been incredibly um, challenging and taunting for you know patients with existing conditions or with existing situation with existing treatment, uh, having to adapt, having to go through that, having to go through that stress. Um, the mental health side of thing uh, is is something we should never neglect. Uh, you know how it affects you, how it affects your uh, family, how it affects your loved ones. So I think that message of solidarity that my colleague was echoing in the video is definitely one, and it's solidarity with you know. Um, yes, definitely, our our um, our colleagues, uh, practitioners, and all um, humanitarians. But let's not forget and put really at the center um, the communities that we're all trying to help uh, with our different mandates and um, and our different work. So we are together, and um, hopefully, let's keep it up. Thank you, Mary Mario, for those uh, inspirational words and, and the video. Uh, was indeed very inspirational and uh, certainly showed us all the great work that you and your colleagues are doing across the world. So I will give the last word to you, um, but it gives me uh, great pleasure to say thank you to you um, for joining us uh, this afternoon, almost into this evening now. Thank you to Médecins Sans Frontières for uh, uh, sharing this uh, information with us and telling us about all the great work that you're doing. I'd like to thank uh, Index Conference and Exhibitions, uh, DHAD and uh, DISA um, for all their support in relation to the uh, this evening's webinar. And of course, to all our participants and attendees uh, who have been sending in questions. As always, I apologize if I didn't get through all the questions, um, but we did our best in the, in the time slot that we have available. So Mario, once again, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to see you and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. I give you the last word, um, and thank you once again for being with uh, us this evening. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, thanks to all the organizers uh, for this great uh, opportunity again. Thank you to all the viewers who are still here, who were with us from the beginning and who stayed here. Um, for people who want to uh, get more information on what our organization does and where, um, I just present you all the handles on social media and on the website. Uh, for those who want to support um, our campaigns, those are the links also to our um, crowdfunding platform. Again, as authorized by the authorities, you are giving in all legality, in all security. But please do follow us. And if you have more questions uh, for me, um, for our organization, uh, you have now um, all the channels that you can use uh, uh, to send us your questions and we'll uh, happily answer them. So um, last word of thanks to everybody involved. And uh, uh, I actually am looking forward to seeing as many people as possible at the next uh, DIAD event uh, next March. Uh, so hopefully see you there. Thank you, Mario. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you once again. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.